Uh, today, <clears throat> I'll be speaking specifically on uh, the species discoveries in the next 45 minutes. And uh, then how are these species discoveries in some way or other uh, promote interdisciplinary science? And also the need for promoting uh, the taxonomy as a, a basic science uh, from where we can uh, plan and think about uh, the, uh, the cutting edge uh, science. Uh, before I start my lecture, uh, let me pay tribute to three stalwarts uh, who actually uh, driven the spirit of uh, biodiversity conservation across the globe, uh, starting with uh, Richard Leakey, uh, Edward uh, Wilson, and uh, Thomas Lovejoy. And interestingly, two persons, uh, Edward Wilson and uh, Thomas Lovejoy, are uh, the persons uh, behind uh, coining the term um, biodiversity as well, uh, biological diversity as well. Okay, so I'll start with these uh, three stalwarts and uh, tributes to them who passed away uh, very recently. And also uh, their work, their works, their publications helped a lot of youngsters in the world to take up uh, biodiversity science as a subject and also uh, taxonomy as a subject. And also they have shown uh, that taxonomy, the people with the background in taxonomy can influence the policy makers and also tell the world that the conservation is very, very important for uh, the world to progress and also to develop uh, in, in the, uh, and also to take up uh, the path of sustainable development. Okay. The outline of my talk, I'll speak about few uh, new discoveries because uh, the uh, limitations in time. And also I'll start uh, uh, speak about the planetary uh, biodiversity in a global uh, scale and also what are the challenges in the conserving the biodiversity and how, how we can link biodiversity with the development and how, uh, we, uh, what are the opportunities for future and then uh, what is the way ahead. And this is, uh, I start with the basic question, how many species inhabit Earth? And this is a million dollar question, probably nobody can answer. And uh, as of now, uh, probably uh, the number of species recorded, which means uh, with a tag of scientific name on it, uh, maybe around uh, uh, 20 lakhs or 2 million. And you can see that major part of uh, the uh, so far recorded life uh, belongs to uh, the animalia or uh, the animals as such. Uh, but whether this is a real picture about the planetary uh, biodiversity or the, the real species diversity across the world. And if you look at the, uh, the recent studies, uh, then uh, this is the, uh, if you consider each of these square as uh, 10,000 species, and then we can see that uh, 2 million species is uh, the record. And there are a large number of estimates, including some of the recent estimates, with, which put the number as 10. But whether this is the real uh, diversity, which is reflected uh, through the scientific investigations. And even when you look at the, uh, anim the species diversity recorded so far, you can see that if among the animals, the major part is represented by uh, the insects. And there are a large number of other groups which are at least represented in this group. Of course, the global animal biodiversity is dominated by insects, but the other groups are less, less, uh, less represented in this uh, connection. And you can see the remaining space and uh, which actually make uh, the world of biologists uh, more uh, confusing and rather confronting, primarily because there are lesser number of taxonomists to describe them. Uh, because many of the uh, zoologists now uh, take up uh, the so-called cutting edge science and uh, the real taxonomy is the number of taxonomists is coming down. I'll come to that in, uh, in the later uh, stages. Okay, there is a recent uh, paper by Maura and uh, Jets, which clearly demonstrate that uh, the 80 percentage of the species uh, we don't know about and may be hiding. And he has, based on a series of analysis, the team has actually prepared a map, which indicate that how many species are there, which, are, which is undescribed in different parts of the world. And if you go with the scale, uh, we can see that uh, the darker uh, shades indicate that you know, the, uh, there are some hotspots across the world where the species uh, discovery is rather incomplete. And if you go with the groups also, you can see that major part of uh, the uh, world, the species discovery, particularly in the developing countries, it's especially in the horse biodiversity hotspots across the world, including the uh, Western Ghats and uh, uh, Sri Lanka and the Indo-Burman region in India, uh, the species discovery is far from uh, complete. And uh, while many of the factors might contribute to species uh, going undescribed, it is uh, mainly due to lack of research funding and uh, uh, lesser number of taxonomic uh, experts across the world 
which actually uh, put a hurdle in identifying the species. So this is the, the, the real picture, almost 80% of the species uh, uh, in, in the planet, we have no information about. And that is the uh, you know, scenario in which we speak about conservation. Okay. And forget about you know, the larger animals, you think about the smaller animals. For example, look at the global uh, microbial diversity across the world, which is also part of the larger biodiversity. And the recent estimates are primarily based on the metagenomic uh, exercises, which clearly uh, demonstrate that Earth is home to almost uh, 1 trillion microbial species. That means you know, our imagination and our understanding about the species diversity is slowly changing uh, because of the technologies and because of the uh, investigations in different parts of the world. Uh, the whole uh, the picture of the global biodiversity is changing. And if Earth is home to uh, 10 raised to 12 or 1 trillion microbial species, and then our estimates about the planetary biodiversity is something very, very uh, meager that we need to understand. And also, if you put in terms of biomass of uh, the organisms which exist in the planet, uh, uh, again, also, uh, we should understand that microbial biodiversity is actually on top. It is not the vertebrates, it's actually the microbial biodiversity which uh, dominate the biomass. And uh, But if you analyze based on the current uh, discovery of uh, species, you can see that in terms of biodiversity, plants play a very, very important role uh, in terms of biomass. And uh, then animals form animals form only 0.4 percentage, and humans, in terms of biomass, accounts only for 0.01 percentage of the global uh, biomass. Yet uh, the human species dominate and control uh, the existence and survival of other species. This is something very interesting happening in the planet. And let me come to some of the recent uh, discoveries: how the science and uh, uh, new conservation genomic studies change the whole percep perception of species and uh, discoveries. And this is a, a, an interesting species. And formerly, this species of whale uh, was referred to as uh, the Mexico Brides whale. And this is also called rice rice's whale, and is named after the uh, famous biologist Dale Rice, who documented the species in 1960s. But the genetic studies uh, recently confirm uh, that the uh, the species in the Gulf of Mexico is entirely uh, different, and uh, the species which are we just washed ashore in uh, Florida is an entirely different species. And then, if you consider go with this kind of species description. And the, the species in the Florida waters is now left with only 100 numbers. And that means, you know, that when you have a precise idea about the species and the population, once we consider that all these species are same and they are widely distributed and on fine morning with the help of technology and uh, conservation uh, genetics, we all understand that this is a distinct species, then there may not be many number of specimens left for conservation. And that is another interesting uh, thing to understand. And precisely uh, indicating that, uh, you know, documenting the species uh, precisely is very important in conservation as well. And another interesting story of uh, blue spotted uh, guitar fish. And uh, this is uh, considered as the common guitar fish and uh, which was exploited heavily in the African waters. And the recent studies uh, with the DNA barcoding uh, revealed that it is an entirely different species of shark. But uh, unfortunately, there is uh, no trade restrictions available. And, and as, as a result, this is overexploited. And at present, it is an endangered species. And uh, in, again, in the recent uh, discoveries, uh, these are the, the, the taxonomists have documented 12 new gecko species from the Indian uh, Western Ghats. And interestingly, naming the species is also very interesting and curious. And one of the species is uh, uh, named uh, after uh, Jackie Chan. And primarily because uh, 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 it is nearly impossible to catch. Uh, okay, it jumps uh, very high and very impossible to catch. And uh, even uh, geckos, you know, twelve species of geckos from the Western Ghats in in uh, documented in a single paper itself indicate that you know the biodiversity uh, is less documented even in uh, the famous biodiversity hotspots like uh, the Western Ghats. And globally also, there are very, very interesting uh, discoveries which happened 2000 in, in 2021. And uh, this is uh, probably the smallest reptile uh, known to science. It's called uh, Brookesia nana. And uh, the size is uh, slightly larger than human nail. And uh, very, very interesting uh, specimens. Uh, when uh, we explore into uh, new areas, uh, we come across very strange species with very strange uh, biology as well. And you can see another uh, species of uh, uh, frog, which is uh, hardly eight to 10 millimeters long. 
and they exist only in one point in Madagascar. And this is the world's uh, smallest frog and uh, in, interestingly named as mini mum. Okay, mini is a scientific name and mum is uh, the uh, specific name. And very interesting uh, discoveries. And in India, of course, we have a mechanism uh, to document uh, the uh, new uh, species discoveries. And uh, uh, last year, so, so in 2020, uh, 21 is a report is yet to come. And uh, the report called Animal Discoveries is uh, uh, being published by Zoological Survey of India. And in 2020, India uh, discovered uh, 557 uh, new species. Sorry, uh, India added. 557 uh, new species to its uh, animal listing. And out of that, 407 are new species. And if you consider that this number is uh, high, I am sure that uh, pretty sure that this number is not high, uh, considering uh, the number of uh, the uh, barcoding exercises going on, and which, will, which I will explain uh, later in different parts of the world. And uh, recently, there is a, a lot of interest in, uh, in surveying animals, particularly certain groups of animals, and uh, especially uh, the frogs and fish. And I should thank some person specifically uh, for initiating this kind of an interest in uh, studying um, certain taxa of uh, organisms in India. And uh, almost 100 new species uh, from uh, one lab. This is something tremendous uh, to the contribution of uh, Indian uh, biodiversity, Indian taxonomy. And I should uh, start uh, mentioning uh, Dr. S. D. Biju basically a plant taxonomist who got interested in animal studies and then got specialized in fish, sorry, uh, from uh, in, in frogs. And he started, he, his first description of a frog was uh, from the Western Ghats, and this is called Nasiga Batraka sahiadrensis. And now uh, this species, uh, again, an interesting scientific name as well, uh, naming the species. And Nasiga, as you can see, it, uh, in this case of uh, this frog, with a very, very prominent nose, and hence the name Nasiga batrachus, and it's since from Sahyadri, hence the name uh, Sahyadrensis. And now this is uh, in a, it's a entirely different family, and uh, this is the first discovery of a new uh, frog family since 1926 uh, when it was published. And in Malayalam, we call it Padala Tavala because it lives uh, uh, within the soil, and now it is considered as an endangered species and a living fossil. And because this is a very unique uh, habitat, it lives among the loose, uh, the soil, uh, the wet soil along the uh, river sides and they come up uh, after the first rain and the male make the call and they fertilize and, uh, you know, they, the female deposit the uh, eggs along the uh, streams and then they disappear, they go back into the, uh, this fossorial animal, go back into the uh, soil. Uh, and this is uh, the way, this is uh, the reason probably uh, why this animal was uh, not discovered for quite long time. Uh, the biology of this animal is uh, uh, interesting, but at the same time, more interesting is actually the genetics. And when there was a genetic analysis, uh, the closest lady of this frog was actually found in Madagascar. And uh, also by estimating, uh, you know, the, the cal calculating uh, the evolutionary time period in which uh, the actual splitting of uh, the two species took place. And then this, uh, the, the, the team has discovered uh, that you know, this is almost the same uh, time in which the, the Madagascar got separated from the Indian uh, continent. And uh, so this discovery from uh, Kerala and this, this discovery from India actually sh uh, show a lot of light and throw a lot of light onto the entire biogeography phenomena, the shifting of continents and uh, you know, the, the, the Gondwana, the, the importance of the Gondwana Island and uh, how uh, these kind of evolutionary principles work uh, presently in the, in the system, et cetera, et cetera. And also uh, some of the other uh, discoveries and how we trigger uh, the interest in uh, scientific communities. And uh, after this discovery of uh, this uh, uh, species, a subterranean species called Horaglanis krishnai, uh, from the subterranean ecosystems, from the, uh, the wells uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the laterite uh, areas of uh, uh, Kotayam district, sorry, uh, and the Patanandita district, uh, uh, it was named as a new, spe new uh, genus called Horaglanis, and it was named after Krishnai, uh, the famous uh, taxonomist uh, uh, that the Kerala has ever produced, the Krishna Pillai. And uh, yeah, I actually, this discovery came from the Department of uh, Aquatic Biology and Fisheries when uh, Dr. Krishna Pillai donated uh, a, a specimen he, which he, his student uh, got from a well in Tiruvalla, near Tiruvalla. And uh, this specimen was sent, uh, sent to Hora, uh, uh, S.L. Hora's uh, lab. S.L. Hora is, was, again, a famous uh, 
uh, ichthyology is called the father of Indian uh, ichthyology. And then they uh, describe the species as horaglandis and new genus and, and new species. And more interestingly, uh, uh, another species was also uh, discovered uh, after that, again from the subterranean ecosystem. Uh, and uh, it was named as uh, Cryptoglanis shaji, uh, named after uh, the famous uh, in, uh, taxonomist, fish taxonomist from uh, Kerala, Shaji. And uh, then uh, when um, the team uh, led by Dr. Rajiv Raghavan, uh, they, they analyzed this, uh, the internal anatomy. The internal anatomy of a species can be described without killing the animal using uh, the micro CT scan. And uh, the micro CT scan, the advantage is that uh, you can uh, take three-dimensional internal anatomy of uh, the uh, animal and you can rotate it uh, 360 degree and uh, without even for a museum specimens without actually uh, non-destructive, uh, uh, non-invasive uh, technique. And you can, uh, you can elucidate the entire uh, anatomical structure and you can elucidate the structure of the bone and et cetera, et cetera. And bone are the days when uh, during the practicals we actually uh, dissected the or you know, baked this animal or frog and collected the bones together and, uh, and separated. It's a very uh, tidy, uh, sorry, it's a Herculean task and uh, time consuming task. And without killing the animal, we can uh, have a detailed uh, look at the internal anatomy of an organism using micro CT scan. And these studies uh, by his team ultimately revealed that this is an entirely different family uh, doing the genetic analysis as well. So this uh, discoveries ultimately prove uh, that uh, you know these organisms uh, are actually uh, uh, part of the uh, larger Gondwana uh, connection. And uh, similarly, another uh, very interesting study, again uh, by the team from uh, Kufos, uh, after the flood, uh, they uh, recorded another specimen called uh, another fish, uh, uh, again a, a subterranean uh, species and probably came up from uh, the uh, subterranean system uh, to the floodwaters uh, during the flood. And uh, when this animal was uh, discovered, uh, the mitochondrial DNA was actually uh, analyzed. And this uh, study uh, revealed that it is uh, uh, genetically different from the 37 other snakeheads or the Channa species from both Asia and Africa. So probably a Gondwana relics, and uh, this discovery shows a lot of interesting facts about uh, you know the distribution of species in Kerala in the Western Ghats and how these species are basically connected with the you know the African elements and also the Gondwana species in elsewhere in the world. So all these studies are very interesting in the uh, recent past, and this uh, species uh, again is a new genus and species Enigma chana golem. And uh, immediately after this discovery, another uh, team uh, of Rahul and uh, uh, Rahul Bashir and Ravi, they came up with another species, uh, again, uh, of the same genus, Enigma Channa, and uh, name, named it as Mahabali, a, a person coming from, again, uh, the subterranean system. And uh, again, a uh, lot of interesting studies to follow. And uh, one, how uh, the connected are the subterranean ecosystems in uh, Kerala and uh, how uh, you know the distribution of these uh, species happen across the system and uh, how uh, the species distribution uh, differ across the western guards and all, all are interesting to study for future as well uh, which will of course reveal a series of uh, other uh, novel observations uh, for the betterment of science i'm sure and uh, also you know when you have a detailed analysis you also can uh, find out how uh, to uh, 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 the distribution pattern of species across the mountain ranges differ. And this is again an interesting study uh, by uh, Arya and, he, and her team uh, in Kufos and other uh, institutions, and uh, which clearly uh, 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 demarcate uh, the species based on the liver, uh, river scapes. And uh, they have done a river scape uh, genetics of two uh, endemic uh, mountain uh, loaches along the Western Ghats. And through genetic analysis, they clearly separated uh, these two species and how the geographical profile of the Western Ghats ultimately drive the species uh, evolution, et cetera, et cetera, can be uh, un understood. And how the populations of hill stream loaches are structured in response to natural and artificial riverine barriers and how these genetic, uh, genetic bottlenecks uh, you know, uh, you know, play a very, very important role uh, based on the geography of the system in evolution of the species. And all these uh, studies uh, from uh, India, in the recent studies, uh, reveal two important facts. One, from morphological taxonomy, we, we should uh, move to uh, the, uh, the integrated taxonomy. 
and how we can uh, get uh, integrated information about the distribution pattern of organism as well as the biogeographic uh, distribution and also how this evolutionary uh, information available these uh, through these studies ultimately help in strengthening conservation science and these are very very important and also i should say that you know the publishing uh, these uh, information in high quality journals is also very very important uh, because you know if you start publishing the taxonomies start publishing in uh, the the so called predatory journals ultimately that will kill the entire spirit of uh, the taxonomy as well as uh, conservation science and coming to another discovery of our team uh, from the uh, western guards and this is a discovery of uh, the first uh, tree crab uh, from uh, india and uh, this uh, uh, species lives in the southernmost part of the uh, western guards we got it from the agastyamala range and that too from a very very small uh, range and the distribution and one of my students is now studying the uh, the distribution pattern in the southern western guards and in the entire range of uh, uh, Agastya Mala, but we could so far find these species only in a limited pocket along the uh, southern part of the Agastya Mala Biosphere Reserve. And uh, you know, this is uh, probably an evolutionary uh, a species with an evolutionary interest because the remaining uh, tree frogs uh, live in uh, in in uh, only two two other species. One lives in uh, Sri Lanka and other in the in the Borneo. Okay, so this species uh, uh, actually the tribal uh, friends. Uh, the Kani tribal fronts helped us in allocating the species. When we were actually sur surveying the freshwater streams along the Western Ghats, uh, they explained to us that another species of crab lives in tree holes. And uh, they live in, inside the water of the tree holes. And then we could uh, find, after a lot of search, we could find uh, the species in the tree holes. Okay. And uh, they breed. And uh, the one difference between uh, freshwater and marine crabs is that marine uh, uh, crabs have a, a, a complex life cycle which involve the uh, larval forms as well. Whereas freshwater crabs, uh, their larvals, uh, there is no larvae in between. The eggs uh, develop directly in, in, in their body and they grow into miniature, uh, the young ones and into adults. And then this is uh, the way they live. And uh, in fact, the, the uh, Kani tribes use them for another uh, medicinal, a lot of other purposes, including for making some oils, etc. And now uh, this is a nocturnal species, but look at the uh, you know long legs, perfectly adapted for arb arboreal life, and studded with uh, stronger spines, which help them in uh, to cling on the uh, the larger trees. And uh, they live in larger trees, uh, in fact, in larger tree holes, as you can see here. And uh, they sometimes you know we the largest number we recorded is eight to ten uh, from a, a single tree hole, five to ten meter. And phytotelmata basically is again a microcosm, uh, an ecosystem it's by itself, a small micro ecosystem. And uh, phytotelmata or the tree holes, uh, because each tree hole carry its own biodiversity, the copepods, and we are now recording uh, copepods, uh, then uh, rotifers, and a series of other organisms. There exists a small, uh, you know, a, a food web and also a, a kind of independent micro ecosystem. So it's a very interesting uh, to study what actually exists in the tree hole and what exactly uh, is the system, how exactly the system functions, especially uh, with the uh, small, uh, smaller or miniature forms of uh, food web available in the system, et cetera, et cetera, and which we are now uh, studying. And uh, because they are also, uh, how do they act as, these tree holes act as a temporary shelter and also as a breeding uh, place for a large number of organisms in a forest is something interesting to study. And uh, again, coming to another uh, uh, discovery which we actually got, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the mud snake. And uh, we have two types of snakes uh, in, in freshwater systems and one is pure uh, water snake. Okay. And second is the mud snake, which usually remain the bottom I, with, in, inside the mud. Uh, this uh, was actually a, you know, a, an accidental discovery. When we were surveying fish in the Valayani Lake of uh, uh, Trivandrum, we uh, came across uh, this species of mud snake. And then we could uh, identify it as Enhydris dizumeri uh, at that period of time. But uh, you know, in, even the Romulus Vitagas field guide, the color photograph or photograph of this specimen was not available. We say, I sent this photograph to uh, our, uh, Vitakar. And Vitakar directed Ashok captain to look into that. And because he was working with the mud snakes and Ashok uh, from Pune, he immediately recognized it as uh, the same species. And there was no color photograph available. 
and uh, then he immediately flew to Trivandrum, and then he uh, we took a color photograph of this animal. And when we publish redescribed the entire species, which was actually published in 1854, and uh, then uh, he, uh, the uh, the other teams working with uh, the mud uh, mud crabs in uh, both the uh, uh, Institute of Natural uh, Natural History in Chicago, as well as another uh, uh, young lady scientist uh, called Kate Sanders working in Australia, they got interested uh, in uh, studying uh, the uh, genetics of this animal or the molecular taxonomy of these animals and to see how Indian species, and this is actually a species endemic to Kerala, uh, this Enhydris uh, dusumeri, and how uh, this is uh, connected with other species genetically. And then uh, we did the sequencing in Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, and then they uh, analyzed the, uh, uh, did the micro CT scan to compare the uh, anatomy of uh, this animal. And then when we did the uh, sequencing of this animal, then we could see that the closest relative uh, lives somewhere in uh, an island, uh, a Chinese island in uh, here. And uh, then we, they also carry a salt, uh, a, a salt tolerant gene. And uh, then it is an indication that probably the species might have traveled uh, through the uh, coastal islands. And uh, that is why there is a connectivity between these two species. And when we look at the distribution pattern of these species, many of the species distribution is actually along the coastal plains across the world, indicating that this there is a connectivity between the marine uh, snakes as well as the mud snakes, and they might have uh, an evolutionary connectivity. And so this study uh, reveals uh, this kind of a relationship. So from uh, the, the uh, a, an accidental species discovery, uh, when you do the genetic analysis, we could also understand uh, how uh, uh, this animal play a very, very important role in the distribution pattern across the world. And that is, uh, again, something astonishing. And uh, then, uh, you know, we could actually uh, go ahead with, uh, again, some of the accidental in interventions and, uh, you know, uh, as not part of our regular uh, investigation. And this is uh, an interesting uh, observation which we made uh, a few years back when we got a call from him, um, Deepani, a, a scientist working on uh, the Arabian humpback whales. Uh, she's an expert in and, and IUCN specialist on marine mammals. And uh, she got a call from Oman where some of the scientists actually tagged the 24 uh, humpback whales uh, from Oman. And one of the female uh, whale called the Luban uh, from uh, the Oman region, Oman waters, uh, she started traveling uh, towards Goa and then uh, took a route towards uh, Kerala and they reached Cochin. And uh, then the, since the animal was tagged, uh, we could, uh, the scientists uh, working in the laboratory in Oman, they, uh, as part of the humpback, uh, Arabian Sea humpback whale network, they could actually locate this animal and uh, through these, uh, you know, the remote sensing uh, data. And then they informed uh, us about uh, their travel. And then we could actually uh, got the uh, support of uh, Coast Guard. Uh, they allowed us to travel in the uh, Coast Guard ship. And then uh, we could actually trace this animal to some extent uh, in Cochin waters. And uh, basically this, uh, this animal uh, travel fast uh, than the ship. And hence then uh, we could not actually follow a longer distance. And then uh, the satellite data made us clear, made it clear that this animal traveled up to the Gulf of Manna region and then went back and reached back Oman uh, in, in two months time. So uh, again, a lot of uh, research questions and uh, why do they travel and uh, how these animals, uh, humpback whales, which produces uh, beautiful sounds and the sound can be heard in water up to 100 kilometers uh, in, in water. And that's how they find out their mates. In and uh, we don't know what the animal eat here and what why do they travel? Whether it is for feeding, whether it is for breeding. So, uh, but we don't have any uh, information on that humpback whale. And then uh, we thought the only persons who are actually uh, working in uh, the marine waters, coastal waters, around the clock are the fishermen. And uh, uh, fishermen, if you could, uh, uh, you know ask them the questions, uh, their knowledge about uh, uh, whales, then we'll get a lot of information. And this is another point that the scientific community in India should actually work in close contact with the, uh, the fisherman, the citizen scientists, and then we could gather a lot of data, especially in the post-COVID era. Even now, they are funding for the basic research, basic science research is very less. Remember that 2022 is actually the international year of basic sciences for sustainable development are declared by the United Nations. And but despite all these things, uh, the funding for basic research is very poor. 
uh, not only in India, but it is happening across the world. But unfortunately, in India, the entire money uh, goes for the so-called cutting edge science alone. I am not arguing that uh, money should not go to the cutting edge science, but there should be a proportion left for the basic science, promotion of basic science as well. Okay, anyway, coming back to the story of Luban, and this uh, female was uh, named Luban. And uh, then we started interviewing the fishermen from uh, all over Kerala and then uh, uh, up to Kanyagumari. And then we, then to our surprise, many of the fishermen knew uh, the time in which the whales uh, travel and they could not identify the species definitely. They consider every whale as a whale. And then they informed us that, you know, there are some uh, specific areas where they aggregate and there is a specific season through uh, uh, season in India for their migration. And also uh, many of them ultimately confirmed that the major area where they spot the whale is an area between uh, Trivandrum and Kanyakumari. And probably they may be moving uh, to uh, Sri Lanka. And then uh, uh, we thought we'll, uh, the only way to study them in detail because of lack of fund, lack of, uh, you know, the, the manpower is to re record their sound, just like, you know, the studying the birds. And then uh, we installed, uh, the, with the help of uh, deep sea divers, we installed a hydrophone to record the sound of whale. Uh, somewhere uh, near uh, Puar uh, in uh, Tuvantan district. And uh, this instrument record the sound continuously for one month. And then we could uh, take back and uh, analyze the data. And when after one month, when we uh, in last uh, uh, December, when we took out the instrument and downloaded the data and uh, analyzed it with the help of uh, the specialist uh, who uh, in acoustics. And then we could found out that we could not actually get the sound of Luban. But interestingly, there were two specimens of or two uh, specimens of blue whale. Uh, talking each other probably because you know each of the uh, the uh, their uh, you know the the behavior on their behavior uh, during the feeding time during the uh, you know the uh, breeding time the the sound uh, the production of sound and frequency may be different so we could I, I identify two specific so two uh, specimens of blue whale communicating each other each other and maybe the forage call and uh, again uh, uh, many details are not available and uh, then last month actually two blue whales were caught in a fishing uh, net near uh, Alep uh, near alapura and uh, we could identify it as a dwarf uh, uh, blue whale so all these are uh, basically the questions which are unanswered and uh, there may be limitation of fund but you know the, these kind of exercises in connection with the uh, citizen scientists or the fishermen could actually enhance our knowledge about the species distribution especially these larger animals uh, which are uh, very very well present in our waters and again uh, when we were actually going to the uh, the uh, uh, mindagara fishing harbor often for collecting uh, the uh, fish or bycatch rather and then uh, we could see that there was a, 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 a predominant species of dolphin uh, very frequently entering into the backwater into the uh, Ashtamudi lake, as you can see here. Uh, and then uh, this is this species is a humpback dolphin, uh, the Sousa plumbia. And uh, now this species uh, enter uh, the estuary very frequently. And uh, their most preferred fish uh, for this uh, uh, humpback dolphin is mullet you know they they have a very interesting group hunting behavior and uh, they travel uh, towards the shallow coastal waters and uh, they hunt in group and they drive these mullet populations especially during the high tide days into the shallow waters and then they feed okay and uh, then the fishermen know this for quite long time and uh, immediately you know when uh, the dolphin drive these uh, uh, fish uh, schools uh, in the shore towards the, the shallow waters, they throw their cast net and they get a bumper catch. Okay, so this is some kind of uh, dolphin assisted cast net fishery and whether the dolphin gets some benefit out of that, I don't know, but I consider it as a parasitic adaptation and then the, you know, the, the fishermen only get the benefit anyway. So this, so we uh, published a paper on dolphin assisted cast net fishery on this and also through the casual observation, another paper on the behavior of dolphins. Very interesting because you don't have to actually go into the venture into the sea but remaining in the in in uh, the breakwaters, uh, you can watch them and study the behavior. So very interesting uh, study, and uh, there is a possibility that you know we can also uh, develop it as a tourism for uh, the uh, dolphin watching, and rather than killing them and eating it, which is very common along the Kerala coast, despite all this kind of uh, understanding that this is a scheduled species. 
and the coming to the future of uh, you know the the uh, biodiversity studies uh, the the major challenge uh, as far as uh, a country like india is concerned and globally as well uh, there is uh, the discussion so far uh, uh, from the discussion so far you could understand that there are many species to be discovered our knowledge on the biodiversity is far far less and is far from complete and then how do you do and then it's actually an expensive affair I, you if you really wanted to study this animal there are a few things which are necessary one for all the exploratory survey you need money okay and how many animals left and many of the recent estimates by top class uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, scientists across the world revealed that there could be at least uh, uh, 10 million species our discovery is only 2 million now and i am not speaking about the microbes that's an entirely different story if you consider the animals as such you know th there may be one uh, animals and plants together there may be one 8.1 million species and how are you going to describe that and uh, you need a lot of money and there is an estimate that uh, eight uh, four hundred billion uh, us dollar is uh, required to describe them and uh, then uh, record them uh, precisely okay but what is the issue the issue is uh, basically a phenomenon called the taxonomic impediment where we have we lack the expert taxonomists across the world in, in many of the museums, many of the laboratories in India and abroad. And uh, then we don't have, you know, the, uh, and, you know, after the COVID, uh, and I'm sure that in many of the museums across the world, they are now, uh, you know, the uh, not uh, recruiting uh, taxonomists fresh. And even for the veteran taxonomists, they are actually uh, are now uh, saying bye bye uh, to the institution, primarily because, uh, you know, they cannot actually accommodate because the lesser amount of fund available. So taxonomic impediment is very much there in India, in, in, in globally. And uh, then how do we do that? And for that, you know, only thing now to proceed with is basically uh, a kind of reliance on the technology. And uh, primarily uh, because uh, there are some positive things also, uh, which, which is uh, provided by uh, the uh, technology development of uh, the electronic uh, media, etc. One, we can have, uh, we can very easily travel across the world for the youngsters, especially the international travel funds are available. So if you really wanted to, uh, if you are excelling in taxonomy and biodiversity science, and if you wanted to visit a fo foreign museum, funds, some funds are available. And uh, if you have a genuine reasons to explain, okay, that is one advantage now. And uh, there is ease of international communication. Even many of the uh, international museums are digitized and we only started digitizing it. We are saying about digitization for quite a long time. Indian museums, nothing is happening actually in picture. And then, uh, you know, the, but many of the international museums, the entire holotypes and paratypes are digitized and uh, we, we could get uh, the information electronically. That is one advantage. And also we have powerful ima ima imaging tools. And even with a mobile phone, you can capture uh, the image of an animal much precisely than with, a, you know, the, the cameras, which was uh, the archive. And that is an advantage, you know, and, and even with that, we can publish the paper. For example, for the fish, if you have a good pixel camera in your mobile phone, that itself is enough for describing a species or, you know, describing a holotype and providing a uh, photograph for publication. And that is possible now. That's another importance of technology. And also uh, for uh, uh, drawing purposes. And you don't have to actually draw with the Indian ink no more. And then the drawing materials are available online. And some of one of my students working with the, the, the crustacean taxonomy, he uses uh, only this uh, uh, the imaging drawing uh, software in, in, the, uh, in the computer. And then the genetic technologies are available and which is now relatively cheaper. And then the databases are much more available now and then for many species. And that actually makes the reference uh, collection much easier. And also publishing is not easy. And I still remember when as a taxonomist, young taxonomist, how much difficulty I found when uh, I communicated the papers to international journals. It's actually a Herculean task, drawing all the things in Indian ink and revising the drawing based on the revision suggestion by the, uh, by the experts and then sending it to the foreign journals and it almost took away more than a month's salary every time. And then that's a difficult affair. And now it's very easy, digital publishing is available. So at present for a taxonomist to work and publish, the things are relatively easy thanks to technology. That's there. And also DNA uh, tells us the stories much more easily, especially uh, we have the mitochondrial DNA, which is single-stranded, 
and some of the genes uh, can tell us stories about uh, the, its evolution, its identity, etc. Especially cytochrome oxidase one, and we then, if you want more precise, then we can go to uh, cytochrome B and some more genes as far as species, uh, fishes are concerned, or the aquatic organisms are concerned. So we have the mitochondrial DNA sequencing technology and the cytochrome oxidase one, a specific, uh, you know, the multi-purpose gene for identification. And uh, this is uh, with this. Uh, we can have a, a larger look at the uh, uh, taxonomy now. And one of the interesting study uh, to reveal uh, the importance of uh, this uh, DNA barcoding and uh, molecular taxonomy, integrating it with uh, the morphological taxonomy, this is very, very uh, important. And for example, you look at the cryptic species. And the classical example is uh, a publication by Jensen. And Jensen, we, I'll be uh, ask, telling uh, you about him in the later uh, period of my talk as well. And uh, he has done a, because there is a, there was a species called a, a skipper butterfly, Astra Aptus fulgurator. Uh, and this species has a wider distribution from US to uh, Southern, uh, sorry, Northern Argentina. And uh, pretty long uh, distance. Uh, morphologically, every uh, specimen looks same. And uh, then uh, after the, you know, the elucidation of the technique called the DNA barcoding, and Jensen and his team, uh, they examined the, these specimens, but they have a doubt in their uh, mind, primarily because their caterpillar larvae, the caterpillars are different, and their foot plant is different. And then they started using this technology to distinguish the species. And uh, then, uh, based on the genetic comparison, they could actually identify it as, uh, you know, a series of different, uh, the phylogenetic tree put them in different uh, uh, clades. And ultimately, they could understand that, you know, this is not one species from USA to Argentina, it's basically 10 species. So all these are cryptic species, basically looking alike morphologically, but genetically they are different. So they have a very important role in conservation, this kind of a knowledge. So this is a classical example of how uh, this kind of uh, mo molecular studies are also important in revealing uh, the exact identity of uh, species. And now going from taxonomy, moving away from taxonomy, this technique of DNA barcoding is also uh, used for uh, many other pur purposes, including forensic, including uh, finding out food alteration, etc. For example, these are three species of marine uh, uh, fish, which are uh, commercially important. And red snapper, of course, is highly valuable than the remaining fish. And uh, when you remove, when you process it and remove the skin, ultimately they all look similar. So it's easy, easy to cheap, uh, it, cheat the consumers and, uh, you know, uh, using a different kind of uh, uh, meat. And uh, now with the help of uh, DNA barcoding technology, it's very easy, as you can see the nitrogenous uh, bases, how uh, the, uh, they differ uh, between the species, even with a short uh, segment of uh, mitochondrial DNA. So from uh, the taxonomy from to, to forensics, uh, this technique is extensively used. And even the, the forest department of uh, India, forest departments in India use this technology to uh, test the meat, which they caught, the, the department uh, caught uh, during their uh, uh, monitoring programs. And also uh, some of these uh, new technologies will help us in precisely identifying commercially valuable species. For example, this is a typical case of a, a, a crab, a marine crab, which is uh, very common in Indian waters. This is called Fortunus pelagicus. So in, 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 in all the fishery data, all across India, we will see only one species called Fortunus pelagicus. But recent studies uh, using DNA barcoding clearly says uh, that uh, even though they look similar, uh, they are uh, genetically different. And now the Indian population is uh, dominated by two other species, not Fortunus pelagicus, and this is Portunus reticulatus and Portunus seginis. So these are the two species now available in Indian waters abundantly. So again, uh, you know, if you actually make the fishery data based on one species, then we could actually end up with the wrong uh, notations about uh, uh, the, the fishery landings. So this uh, kind of uh, precise integrative taxonomy ultimately help us in delineate, delineating the commercially valuable species as well. And coming out with uh, you know the complaint about the the expenses involved and uh, if you uh, the especially with the genome sequencing and uh, right from the beginning if you look at uh, the the sequence uh, uh, the expenses involved in sequencing it is coming down it is coming down and uh, you could actually in Canada you can, you could sequence uh, you will get a DNA barcode a mitochondrial uh, gene sequence at one dollar 
okay, if you have uh, the tissue with you. And uh, that is actually the uh, way in which the, the prices are coming down. And that means even in a country like India, uh, if you have a small fund, you can work on the genetic uh, integrative taxonomy without much uh, complication. That's an indication. Okay. And coming again uh, to the, the global uh, programs on biodiversity monitoring and species uh, discoveries. And this is an interesting program uh, launched in 2019. This is called uh, BioScan. And BioScan, uh, basically, uh, the, uh, this is a multi-million dollar uh, program. And uh, this ultimately will revolutionize our understanding of biodiversity and our capacity to manage it. And uh, uh, it involves more than 100,000 researchers from 40 countries, a multi-million uh, dollar uh, program, and initiated by International Barcode of Life, uh, an organization called uh, IBOL. OK, and then what they do? And their ultimate aim is to speed up the discovery of species. And you know, the, with the help of limited manpower and the taxonomic impediment, you could not actually uh, document the entire diversity globally. So you should have some kind of larger funds available and the use of technology available. And the first uh, aim of uh, this project is to speed up the discovery of species. And uh, they use uh, modern means to increase identification of millions of species yet to be discovered by analyzing hundreds of uh, millions of uh, specimens from freshwater, saltwater, and the land resources. And uh, they use all these kind of uh, metabar coding exercises uh, to understand how many species uh, live in the planet. And uh, recent uh, estimates uh, of the, the eyeball team predict that the species number may be 20, mil 12, 20, mil 20 million. No, the, our record so far is 2 million. So uh, you can imagine and the number of species to be discovered. And they are developing new protocols and sequencing platforms so that you know the whole process will be much more uh, faster. And second uh, uh, major objective of this program is to understand the interaction of species. Now, primarily, this will uh, investigate the complex ecosystem of species, and uh, uh, that is very important because you know a species cannot survive uh, by its own. And there will be complex interactions, and there will be you know the the uh, the symbiotic organism working within the species, and also there will be frequent interaction with the non-living systems. And how do these kind of interactions work in a, in a in a uh, complex manner? And that can be understood through uh, the integrated taxonomy approach by the conservation genomics approach by analyzing the DNA of the connected organisms and how do they interact? And this kind of a, a knowledge will ultimately enhance our uh, understanding about biodiversity, especially with the common cells, mutualist parasites, and uh, even parasitoids, all the symbiotic uh, uh, organisms. And we are also now part of the global, uh, you know, a kind of uh, symbio symbiosis, genomic symbiosis uh, program, which we are now initiating with the jellyfish, with the zoos and the as well. And then uh, this program ultimately worked with the species dynamics also. For example, uh, this program will study many of the world's areas as they are uh, defined by their environmental conditions. And then we can, we can understand how do these environmental conditions play a very, very important role in determining the species uh, distribution across the globe uh, in different ecosystems and biogeographic zones. And this will provide a larger uh, picture about uh, uh, the beta gamma biodiversity across the world and how these uh, interconnected systems work, especially with the marine ecosystem, how the distribution patterns uh, remain, and how important are the, uh, the genetic connectivities. All these are a part of this larger project. And then how do they work? And basically, it's again a, a highly uh, funded project. But during this uh, period of time, in the last uh, few years' time, uh, they could actually describe more than 40,000 species in a very, very small uh, span of time using this technology and a, particularly in the species rich uh, region in Costa Rica forests. And then I'll, I'm coming specifically uh, to the Costa Rica uh, experience. How do they uh, do that? And uh, these two persons are very, very important. I started uh, telling you about uh, Dr. Jansen. And Dr. Jansen and his wife, uh, Winnie, uh, they were actually, uh, they're all basically taxonomists working with uh, insects, specifically with the butterflies. And uh, they, since uh, Costa Rica is uh, the most biodiverse region in the world and one of the biodiversity hotspot, a small country, but <clears throat> it harbor uh, almost 4% of the entire uh, biodiversity of the Europe. Okay, <clears throat> so Costa Rica is very, very important uh, in terms of biodiversity. And these two scientists, they migrated to Costa Rica primarily to document biodiversity. And then, uh, you know, what they did is they finally settled in Costa Rica. 
and then you know this entire uh, part of the costa rica was basically forest and uh, you know inhabited by the tribals therein and indigenous people and what they did is simply you know the the indigenous people know about the biodiversity and then they recruited them for documenting biodiversity that means you know it reduces huge amount of money involved with the project and then they were given specific uh, uh, allowances or uh, honorariums for collection and uh, scientific collection uh, the, the whole process of scientific uh, uh, material collection was demonstrated to them they were trained and he named uh, for the first time he also coined the term para taxonomist okay so they work for the taxonomists make all the collections from different areas scientifically precisely categorize them and keep them in different uh, you know the the uh, bags and uh, give it back uh, to uh, jansen slab and uh, then jansen also did a lot of things uh, parallelly and uh, he started a nationwide uh, bioliteracy programs uh, making the people uh, understand about the importance of life and you know the biodiversity conservation especially in a developing uh, or rather underdeveloped country like costa rica and uh, they also uh, uh, told the people why the dna barcoding uh, technologies are important and uh, and this is very important in uh, 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 documenting biodiversity and especially when you speak about uh, the nagoya protocol and all the things why and this uh, documentation within the country is so important so he uh, with the help of international funding he launched a program called the bio alpha project and through that he documented almost all the uh, butterfly diversity across the uh, country and then uh, he also uh, started a cost uh, a larger project uh, involving the local people and uh, traveling to villages and how the villages also can also be part of the whole exercise and then he trained them how to use the malay straps to uh, trap the uh, organisms and his lab did the barcoding and uh, you know uh, then ultimately they uh, projected uh, that uh, 10 million species uh, is uh, the biodiversity of costa rica and they have so far uh, uh, based on their barcoding experience uh, they say that 10 million is a moderate estimate it may go up to 15 million now we initially start with describing uh, the 2 million organisms and it is almost uh, uh, 15 million in costa rica alone if you consider uh, the uh, all the larger organisms and the leaving microbes uh, viruses and protista so that means even uh, you know the people's involvement in uh, the uh, uh, taxonomy exercises and uh, documentation of the animals through uh, barcoding will give you a uh, actual realization of what amount of biodiversity exists in a particular a particular country and uh, you know then he, uh, he says that uh, uh, how do you answer this question why this species discoveries and documentation is important for the world okay and then first answer is that you know uh, this question uh, for the politician it may be different and he may find a technology a device more important than a species but actual understanding of living world and what actually the world uh, uh, looks like with with the animals surrounding us this is very very important because uh, ultimately it gives you a picture about the future of the world and how do we try, uh, survive and how do the you know the developing countries or tropical countries can get the benefit out of the biodiversity and uh, now we think about the genes the novel molecules bio uh, the the molecules with a lot of bio, biological potentials and uh, we call it nutraceuticals we call it bioactive compounds which can work against the bacteria antimicrobial antiviral antifungal components and for documenting everything for use of biotechnology we should actually understand the whole organisms and there lies the importance of all these organisms and once you have a precise documentation and with the help of integrative taxonomy which apply morphological as well as uh, genetic tools in addition to other uh, biological uh, characters it play a very very important role in determining the future economics of a particular country because this is very very important for as because these are the pillars for all these kind of developmental exercises which we are actually planning then another th the importance is that you know we have lesser amount of taxonomies available and think about the environmental impact assessment exercises in india for example and we go to an area make a simple collection one day and realize that the chalakudi river carries only 15 species of fishes okay despite the fact that it's actually a world uh, one of the world's important hotspot for point endemism but we don't realize that 
because we don't use any kind of technology we simply make a survey on one fine morning and say that there is no uh, you know very critically important organism in that place and all these can and be uh, you know reduced all these kind of uh, debates can be avoided once you have a dna barcoding exercise even without killing the organism you can uh, you know uh, document the biodiversity and even with the metagenomics tools you don't even have to collect the organism through the environmental dna sampling itself we could identify how much uh, diversity exists in the system so all these things can be applied for future in biodiversity conservation once you have a planning for that okay uh, i'm coming to the last part of my uh, lecture and uh, for example if you look at the biomonitoring exercises and Canada has already launched a program wherein they use uh, DNA barcoding and metagenomics and environmental uh, DNA analysis uh, for uh, documenting the diversity of life. So with the biomonitoring, they have also have a platform called biomonitoring2.org, uh, which actually gives training and uh, offer protocols for studying uh, or biomonitoring using uh, the DNA technologies and environmental DNA. So this is also possible. And the last uh, barcoding uh, conference where uh, uh, there, there was an in, uh, introduction of a gadget uh, called Gene C or Gene Z, uh, a device for handheld uh, eDNA detection in the field, and uh, uh, which will ultimately help uh, in detecting it's a handheld device, ultimately help in detecting environmental DNA. And uh, uh, this is again, so the technology is, uh, uh, you know, developing in, in a uh, much much faster uh, pace so that you know many of the complex uh, answers uh, can be uh, given uh, especially with the biodiversity so our uh, ultimate aim is uh, to better understand biodiversity and go ahead with uh, you know a stronger database which is lacking in india because that's lacking in many of the uh, the developmental projects where we provide with the minimum amount of data once you have a better understanding of biodiversity through these uh, modern tools and then document everything digitally uh, in the library of life. And then it can be used for uh, monitoring and uh, tracking uh, biodiversity changes and uh, biotic changes, especially in the era of climate change. So this is the ultimate aim of uh, the, uh, the planetary biodiversity uh, and the people thinking about planetary biodiversity, how the documentation of registering all the species using technology and digitizing the entire information in, uh, in the library of life and ultimately using this data from mere species identification to bio uh, monitoring bio biomes ecosystems and uh, bio monitoring and also to track uh, changes which is occurring in the ecosystems and that's the ultimate aim of uh, these kind of exercises and it's a larger task uh, 10 million or 20 million species to document them it's a larger task for this larger task to achieve uh, you know especially in countries like india we know we need a lot of uh, manpower we need a lot of uh, train uh, investment in this and ultimately, the, uh, the people or the bureaucrats and the policymakers should understand that documenting life is also essential when we think about uh, biodiversity and uh, when we think about development as well. So ultimately, this planetary biodiversity mission uh, by 2040 uh, ultimately uh, you know, uh, envisage uh, a better document of life and uh, using this uh, uh, data for bio surveillance and bio monitoring and the tracking the changes which is occurring in the ecosystems and this is a, a very ambitious program but uh, let, let us appreciate it that because you know this is again uh, how the biodiversity information can be used for uh, you know the predicting the changes in nature and also in in conserving uh, nature in a larger scale and so the think tanks ultimately think about uh, you know including uh, conservation uh, genomics for uh, conserving this uh, animals and uh, species and ultimately uh, came up with uh, better uh, solutions and ultimately to cause uh, stop the sixth extinction which is uh, going on and also technologies are supporting and new technologies are coming up uh, rather than sanger we have other uh, uh, the sequencing machines like sequels which will provide you a better read a longer sequences in a shorter period of time you can sequence almost a thousand samples at a particular period of time and get the data overnight so technologies are uh, rather developing much faster and then uh, our duty is to see that uh, you know we also use this technology to be part of this uh, international exercises our ultimate aim is again to fill these gaps and i hope uh, that uh, this kind of a better understanding about the biodiversity and uh, better provisions for documenting life will ultimately help us in uh, putting biodiversity at the center point of our uh, discussions on conservation and uh, development thank you